Okay, fantastic. Welcome, everyone. Everyone's just slowly coming in. So welcome to our Workforce Wellbeing webinar series. This is number six. We had a little pause over Christmas for various reasons that will be explained. And tonight we're having a bit of a pause and reflect on how we're doing now. But while we're just waiting for people to turn up, I'm just going to invite people who are sat in the audience waiting to join in a bit of a poll. How are you doing? I see you. So if you haven't done this before, most of you are pretty used to this by now, but if you go to menti.com and then you type in that code, then you should be able to just give us a couple of words that explain kind of where your head is at at the moment. So we'll just give you a couple of minutes to do that as the next, as the participants come in. So if you're just joining us now, if you could fill out the Mentimeter, if you're willing to, and just let us know how you're doing. It's completely anonymous. And then we'll get started with the webinar. Okay, so I'm I'm going to get moving. I I need to move on to my next slide before I can see the results of the Mentimeter. But welcome to the Intensive Care Society's Workforce Wellbeing webinars. I'm Julie Highfield, and I'm joined by a panel of ICU professionals from different professions from different areas of the UK. And tonight we're going to be thinking, how are you? Um, and then I'm going to do uh, a few slides to just kind of set the scene um, to make sense of all the conversations I've had over the last year with my ICU team um, locally, but also across the country to make sense of, of why we feel how we feel. And then we'll have a panel and Q&A um, discussion. So our, our panel of, of um, multi-professionals will come together and kind of reflect on the things that have been said um, and then invite you to um, chat with us as an audience. What I would say is feel free to ask us questions as you go along, but please put it in the Q&A function, not the chat function. So I'm going to hopefully have some magic where I stop sharing this screen and I go to sharing this screen and there we go isn't it fascinating that the big word in the middle is the word that absolutely describes me right now so thank you icu com community for validating how i feel today tired and exhausted stretched worried but proud motivated, relieved, especially for those of you who are starting to come out of that second wave. And I can see that there is anxiety, trauma, but there's also hope. Glazed, glazed is a good word. Yeah, okay. Can everyone see what I'm seeing? Amy, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see the word cloud? Fab, I've just never done it like that before. So uh, very pleased to see that work okay back to back to the um slide so just a, 
a run through. I just wanted to set the scene really. And I'm glad to see that the word cloud kind of just matches uh, everything that I was anticipating people would say. So just to have that glimmer of positive emotions, I noticed when I wrote this, I just flurried out all of these negative emotions. And I thought, gosh, no, no, there was joy and there has been pride in this. So, so let's not forget that. Absolutely. Job, job well done in many ways and just how people have come together. But yeah, people are so exhausted right now. And I think a lot of people have found that they've just found it completely impossible to have any headspace, any ability to switch off from thinking about work. And people might be struggling with their sleep right now. People might feel quite anxious and edgy right now. I think some people, the anxious edgy might actually be more irritable, angry edgy and snappy and raging for some people. I think let's not forget about those people who feel that they weren't part of it for whatever reason, maybe shielding or maybe their own health problems or just with the stress of it having to take a step back and the guilt that some people have felt. And it is what it is. The 2020 phrase, uh, I am bored of that phrase, but that flattened, jaded place, jaded was a text message I got this week from someone really senior. Um, that's just how we're feeling right now. And for some people, yeah, absolutely traumatised. It has been a hell of a year. But there is hope. There is hope. So to try and make sense of some of these emotions i've kind of pulled some thoughts together for you guys and we'll debate this as as a group as well so uh, early on in the pandemic you would have seen the thing that i wrote with the intensive care society about phases and then um myself and a, a group of people in the british psychological society uh, kind of fleshed that out quite significantly and, and the um, website is there if you want to see the full paper. But we basically predicted um, phases and at the time it was early March and we were in that anticipatory anxiety mode and then we saw this absolute surge of energy, these you, you know sheer heroics and surge to solution but we cannot sustain that no, no society can sustain that. And where we're at is just passing through the second core active phase and we're in disillusionment and exhaustion. And, you know, we dared in that document in March to predict the recovery phase and we're not there yet. Um, so we don't really know what our long-term ICU recovery from this will be, what our uh, long-term public recovery from this will be and how that will affect our psychology. So we're, we're in this kind of the, the flat before the, the kind of hope on the horizon. And one of the things that has been a, a particular thing throughout all of this is a real understanding that all of this anxiety, the stress of PPE, the numbers of patients coming through, the worry about infection, this overloads our autonomic nervous system. We are super, super, super overstimulated at work. It's all coming at you. And then you come home and it's on the TV and it's on your WhatsApp and it's on the, the news and it's on Facebook and it's on Twitter. And it's just there, that chronic overstimulation. But then we're all in the, the various ins and outs and various stages of lockdown and social isolation. So our, our autonomic nervous system just gets completely confused by this. So we're in that kind of overstimulated fight zone all the time versus that kind of understimulated kind of uh, trying to rest and recover, but also sometimes being incredibly bored. Um, and certainly, you know, in the first wave, I saw so many people who just made the most of the activity or work and probably overdid it. Um, and people were better at not doing that the second time round. 
but I think we we all went through phases of kind of connecting, reconnecting with work because work became our everything. And it has been chronic, excessive workload. We are not designed to work in surge in the sustained way that we worked. So no wonder we're all absolutely tired and exhausted trying to kind of catch up on sleep and catch up on downtime now. And it's the sheer volume of it. It's not just the volume of numbers, but it's the volume of stories and, and the guilt that staff have, have told me they've felt for um, some patients merging into one and trying to really struggling to differentiate one day from another. Um, and for obviously for some people, there are specific traumas that linger and last with them and that leaves them at, at risk of, of post-traumatic stress. And it's the bandwidth, you know, within that overstimulation, it's just the complete inability to think clearly and the cognitive overload um, and that kind of inability to squeeze in any other information. Moral distress has been the, the phrase of the pandemic. Um, and when I talk to people, I, I try to work out what, which has been your moral distress. And in many ways, if you think of it as we see what we need to do, but we just can't do it for whatever reason, for whatever restriction. So for the nurse on the front line, knowing that they can't wash their patient or shave their patient because they've got three patients or four patients. Uh, for the doctors having to run through decision making more often uh, and more quickly um, and having to get through larger numbers of patients. For the AHPs struggling to be able to do the kind of rehab they want to be able to do because of PPE, because of exhausted staff. Um, we want to do it and we can't do it. And that gap between if we blame ourselves, that's where. The, the real risk lies. And I think that has been a big thing through, for everyone um, throughout this pandemic. And certainly I felt it myself. And then of course, there's the contagion of it all and herd behavior. And actually it's really, really hard when everyone else is struggling in the team, you, you can, you either separate off from them or you go with them it's it's the nature of it so if we have a group as a group we respond to each other's anxieties and a big thing that we don't talk about enough is the grief and the loss in this pandemic there has been so many losses and not just in terms of losses that are deaths but actually in terms of loss of connection um, our connection with the patient uh, connection with families and, and the distance of families, um, our patients' families, but also our, our own families, and a loss of connection with others um, and each other on the ICU and how, um, yes, in many ways we've come together, but also in many ways we've been pulled apart. And I think if you go a bit deeper for a lot of people, it's like, what's the job anymore? What is an ICU professional anymore? Are we shifting what we do? Is this the new normal for us? Is this how it's going to be? And what's what's my role in this? And can can I can I handle that? Do I am I signed up for that? And of course, you know, beyond the ICU, our loss of of freedom, um, that other awful phrase of 2020, 2021, the new normal. We'll skip over that phrase really quickly. And it's kind of thinking about how have has 2020, how has the pandemic changed our relationship to the job and changed our relationship with each other? Because that runs deeper than burnout. It runs deeper than PTSD. It's about our joy at work. It's about our experience at work. And that has changed for many of us. And then we have the phrase that came out my mouth one day that has now become one of my classics 
Uh, I was asked early on in the pandemic by a very senior member of staff, why is it, Julie, that we can't have what we had in that first wave, which was the energy of snow days? And I didn't come up with the clever line at the time, but it occurred to me afterwards, that's because those snow days have shifted to make it, it feeling like every day it snows. It makes it feel like it, the new normal is living in Alaska. To just a quick plug for the stuff we have been doing with the Intensive Care Society. It's all free, it's all out there. You don't have to be a member. This is the bottom line to this all. We have support for you, one-on-one -on -one support with professional psychologists, spaces like this to, to reflect, uh, a training program to learn and written resources support for your workplace. I've got many of my peer support trainers with me this evening to try and promote that caring for each other culture. We're running reflective spaces for leaders. I in the background, not very visible on Twitter, but I in the background have helped double the number of ICU psychologists in the UK. And we've also, as a team, pulled together a, a way of benchmarking your workplace against wellbeing standards, 10 wellbeing standards, and it's all available to you on our website. But the project isn't the whole answer. Um, to me, what our staff need are three key things, safety, development and trust. What we all need is to return to a sense of pre-surge capacity so that we can feel clinically safe again, so that we reduce the risk of harm to our patients and we reduce the risk of harm to each other and to, to our staff. And then we need reinvestment and continued investment, education, planning, progression, but also the infrastructures, um, the physical environment, the equipment. And we need space to rebuild trust. We need, I hate to say it, but we need the ICU roadmap. We need to know how we're going to rebuild our workplace. So I'm going to stop sharing there. And I'm going to open out to my lovely team of multiple professionals of the ICU. Can I, can I get you guys to just say your first name and your profession? Um, if we just go around, just so the audience know the, the different professions we've got here. So, Sarah, if you go first. Hello. Um, thank you very much for having me here tonight. Um, my name is Sarah and I'm a critical care sister. Thanks, Sarah. Lorna? Oh, yeah, I'm Lorna. I'm a critical care sister in Coventry. Fab. Amy? Hi, I'm Amy. I'm one of the advanced clinical practitioners. Andrew? Hi, <laughs> I'm Andrew. I'm a, I've been intensive care charge nurse and now a researcher. Gemma? I am Gemma. I'm a critical care speech and language therapist. Nia? Hey everyone, thanks for having me. I'm Nia and I'm an advanced physical care practitioner. And Shagan. Hi everyone, I'm Shagan. I'm a doctor and I'm an intensive care registrar in London. Fab. Thank you, uh, guys. I know, um, know those slides are pretty heavy going, um, but quite representative of the word cloud and what our audience out there said i wonder if i could just open out and just sort of say what well, what if what if those slides just kind of resonated for your experience and the experience of your co-workers um, i don't mind no, i don't on. mind going um go for I it Lorna. The, i think the one that stands out for me the most is the moral distress mm -hmm. i think where we are at the moment people are really struggling with aspects of nursing at the moment um it's, it's really really quite sad when you talk to some people you hear a little you hear a lot of what's the point why are we doing this um I think when patients are getting obviously we've seen so many come through when patients are getting to a certain point uh, they're that sick a lot of the nurses are why are we carrying on 
why are we doing this why are we and and it's a real real struggle for some of our nurses and that's and, it, and it's distressing because every part of us wants to save everybody and wants to care and you know but people are we've got used to I think when when patients like I say get into a certain point we've stopped treatment or but it's I don't know it, it's really really hard people have just become numb to it I think they've stopped getting deeply upset deeply sad it's just they've become quite robotic I think in a way and that's really really upsetting a lot of staff um then they're questioning should I continue doing this job should I be a nurse um and that's that's what I'm finding really hard is seeing people that have been in a job for 20 plus years that have loved their job for 20 plus years and they're at the point where they're like I don't know if I want to do it anymore because they've stopped feeling almost yeah Yeah. Yeah, absolutely and I think you know that that's where that element of potential burnout comes in where they learn to kind of cut off as a, a way of just coping with just the sheer volume of it and I you know I often think that that dealing with kind of um you know potential outcome limitations and keeping going is is was a problem pre-pandemic for us in the ICU wasn't it but there's something about this sort of the sheer volume of it now um and I think that the absolute stretching that we we can't give as much as we'd really ideally it's a coping mechanism as well isn't it for a lot of people they've had to just really distance themselves and disengage yeah. from yeah. the job that they're that you know that they're trained to do and you know yeah. Yeah. naturally you care don't you and they really just there's a there's a big disengagement with people and it's yeah. it's really sad actually really sad yeah. to see does that fit with other people's experience yeah I was I was going to say uh the same about the the moral distress and the kind of um seeing colleagues in that position but also patients um mm. and that their their coping mechanisms our coping mechanisms then just not available they would have their family in to help them support yeah. them um and uh, I'm, a, I'm a speech therapist so our rehab uh, we've really had to kind of try and support very very broken patients through that um when their coping mechanisms just aren't there because of what they've been through but also that their you know their networks and what they would usually go to aren't there but I suppose that's the same for us as well isn't it that actually you would do all sorts of different things in order to cope with what you're seeing at work and what you're experiencing um and for us as well we've we've just come home into a a lockdown scenario so yeah yeah I think that really resonates the other thing that I think I was just going to say was about the the loss of connection um I think you know I've really missed my colleagues the ease of those quick uh conversations even just a bit of banter um on the unit um finding out the information that you need is far more difficult and and often felt that I'm making decisions on my own because actually the, the the colleagues around me haven't been there to support or bounce off those ideas and once I'm in PPE I'm there and I've got to do it there because I'm not going to go out and come but you know it, it's a real challenge and that connection um, has been a really uh, difficult thing and I think the zoning of the unit and all of that goes a long way doesn't it with that kind of everybody just feels very very isolated um, in the ICU. Yeah yeah Fab. Thank, thank you, Gemma and Lorna. Opening it out to the rest of you of, of the kind of the resonance for you and your unit. I think um, speaking for me personally, Julie, well, on behalf of my colleagues, um, everything, all of those things resonate. At some point or, or another, I felt all of those things. Um, and I think an overwhelming emotion for me has been guilt um all the way through this pandemic so guilt to my colleagues the expectation that I have on them you know to take more patients and more patients working in full PPE for longer periods of time that have been stretched and stretched um guilt to the my patients because they're not getting the care that they would have done pre-pandemic um and you know, the standards like not being able to comb hair and, and 
you know, do a nice plait or something really nice for a patient, give them a shave. Um, guilt to the relatives that want to be there, but, you know, we have to stick by the rules and they can't be there. I feel enormous guilt to them. So, yeah, I, I feel that what has been a strong emotion for me all the way through has been this element of guilt that I've carried. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for sharing. Just coming to the other guys, what, what would you add to, be, to what's been said so far? I do, I do feel like it's the instability of the feelings, the very powerful feelings. And it's not, you never just have one singular feeling on that shift. You can see your colleagues in that way of themselves of going through all of the different emotions and you kind of tiptoe in because you don't know what emotion they're at at the minute of what they need from you. So it's, it then has a ricochet effect on everybody else. So then they have their cycle of feelings as well. And it's, it's adding more pressure on ourselves. And we're not as open and talking about our, those feelings to help each other. And we're not always at the same point at the same time, no. are we? No, we're not. It's really important to identify that, you know, we're not swimming along the same river at the same time. Absolutely. And I think you can be in a positive place and have brought yourself out and then you kind of ricochet back in uh, when you kind of think, oh, gosh, maybe I should be feeling like my colleagues are feeling you kind of bounce back in again. It's, it's back and forth, back and forth. Absolutely. Isn't it? Yeah. I am. Um, I just like. So I. I'm slightly different. So I came back into intensive care because I was out doing research. And I came back in, um, and I. And I. It all. All of that resonate resonates. The four phases in particular, I think, are incredibly accurate. Um, and and I see those emotions in the staff that I've been working with, but I have to say, just sort of coming back in and just having for the first time in years having that sort of slight. Um, uh, less involved view because I'm not a permanent member of staff in the intensive care. The the standard and the quality of care is 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 incredible. I mean, I've been so impressed um, to to see that and to see what everybody has achieved. You know, we are we do talk a lot about what we haven't been able to do, um, but I but I would just like to to say that yeah, very very, very impressive from very junior members of staff looking after multiple patients, which I didn't do for the first five or six years of my career people who have just doing the course have, have managed it and managed it extremely well so yeah I I, well, I have um, many many phrases that get me through the ICU that have got me through years of, of the ICU and one of them is in critical care we're critical of ourselves mm. and I think that that's just something it, it is wider in the NHS that problem but I think it, it, it's it's plus plus in critical care we tend to tell ourselves off quite a lot and, and focus on what we haven't managed to do and and coming back to the moral distress that's why it, it can be so strong really but it's it's important to recognize just what an amazing job yeah people have managed to do as well in spite of all of this um and how how people you know people are exhausted because somehow people have kept going yeah actually as well yeah what one one thing i would say is, so i've been working with patients after they've recovered um in some trials and um if you're feeling down and it, it's really worth finding some testimonies there's there's something on the on the bbc south today i know not every it's a regional bbc program not everyone will see it from a patient thanking staff in intensive care and there are, there's lots of examples it's it's really worth looking those out as well seeing them sitting in their garden and talking to the reporters and what have you whatever they're doing in that context is is, is that's very real too that's we've yeah. we've got a gallery on our back wall where we all stand done in and our rehab team have got letters and photographs of our patients oh, either on the ward or they've gone home and for people to just stand while they're getting ready to go in and read these pictures it's it's made a huge difference it's because yeah. yeah. we're so used to patients coming back to visit you know and it's like oh brilliant yeah this is why we do the job but obviously with that all being stopped you you lose sight don't you of why why you're doing it and it's just all been so negative we don't people have said I don't feel like we've saved anyone 
but we have do you know what I mean we really really have and and having those pictures in the back corridor has been fabulous really good to see brings you back to your core purpose doesn't it sorry yes. Gemma say so from being on the kind of rehab side of things so still in the ICU but with those patients who are perhaps talking for the first time or spending time with their you know when you get their family on the FaceTime or they they get to the end they're so grateful they are you know they'll never forget us and what we've done for them and their family are so grateful of everything we've done and it is those things as you say Andrew you know that we do need to remember that it is tough but we won't it, it won't be forgotten by by those people that we've treated yeah. And it means the, the absolute world that we were there with them and we helped facilitate FaceTime and we held their hand when they were struggling and all of those things that they couldn't do. They, that does mean the world. Absolutely. Just want to come to, to Nia and Shagan and give you an opportunity. Is there anything you, you want to add from either, either the stuff the guys have been saying or from the stuff from the slides that resonates? Yeah, I think that, um, as Andrew said, the the four uh, pieces that you that you had on, I can co totally identify with that. You know, there was almost sort of an, an excitement and an anticipation at the start that this was something new that nobody had ever seen before, and we were all going to be involved in it. Um, and then, but maybe we weren't expecting to be involved in it for the whole twelve months. And it's um, yeah, people are very broken there's a there's a fair bit of burn out I think now um uh, but it's you know and as as um, Sarah said different people are at different places at different times and it's about how the team can support each other that's what I've noticed where I work you know and on some days people are up and they and they're pulling along and helping those who are a little bit more down so I think it's certainly um it honed the team spirit if I've I mean, where I work, definitely. I think the team are probably stronger because of it. I think that's a really important point you just said, Nia, because um, with those stages, um, me personally speaking, I've hopped through those stages as well. They've not been a continuum where I've you know, started at the beginning and worked through each one. Like, for example, um, not the not in the first phase, um, um, I tend to the anticipatory anxiety, that's mm -hmm. what I'm thinking about. You know, I've worked in critical care for 21 years, but before I start a shift, I will never sleep properly the night before. So the night after I'll sleep like a baby, but there'll always be some anticipatory anxiety and that's been heightened through the pandemic. I can, I can you know, safely say that. But then um, the active phase as well, you know, I've hopped in and out of that. So um, seeking solutions like there isn't enough staff, we're depleted in staff, um, but we need to prone X, Y, Z many patients. So then we've we've collated a proning team and a group of people have come from theatre and they've helped us, bingo, that's brilliant. But then I might hop to, you know, the last phase where I feel like I'm being reflective and restorative. So I've hopped in and out of these stages, um, but I'd personally say that the active phase, which I would enlighten to feeling like we're in battle, on the battlefield, you know, in that moment, just, just trying to, to save as many patients as we can um, and just getting through, that's probably where I'd say I've, I've stayed the most in those phases. Yeah. You know, just as you were describing back the phases to me, I'm just, I'm going to come to, to Shagan and see what he thinks. Just remember, Shagan, that the kind of wellbeing webinars we've run with the ICS over the years and my, my most tweeted slide, the critical care roller coaster. And it just makes me think, my God, the, the, the critical, critical care is a roller coaster on a day to day. And we have that surge of adrenaline and excitement. And, and yeah, we're doing this and the, the kind of oh, oh, flat periods, bored periods, sad periods, um, and then back up again like on a day to day basis. And it's like that the, the kind of the style of critical care is then mirrored by the whole of the pandemic has been like one one giant roller coaster 
for us all. Um, and just kind of Shagan, just to give you a chance to come in now, but um, it just I'm thinking about the stuff we've done together over the years, and it, it just really um, it's such a parallel um, to to things we've been thinking about pre pandemic um, in in kind of ICU sort of staff experiences. So yeah, thanks for listening to everybody's stories. Actually, to everybody, thank you for sharing. It's really quite wonderful hearing your perspectives and hearing how you just be honest. Um, so I guess I have to follow in a similar vein. So I think the first thing to say is my perspective is going to be slightly different. So I'm a rotating registrar. I don't have um, a single base. In the time of the pandemic, I've worked in three different hospitals. Um, the second thing to say is my perspective is also very different because I have a because I have roles in the intensive care society and the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. I got involved very early on in tracking the pandemic and doing a lot of knowledge dissemination. So basically, a lot of this stuff for me started happening at the end of January last year. And just like you, I have been on a complete roller coaster of emotion, and I can identify a lot of those. But the overwhelming emotion I have right now is actually anger. And I feel profoundly angry at a lot of different things. I guess part of it is anger at the state, the, the state of society and the fact that the fact that the first time round the infection spread to the point where the lockdown happened relatively late and then we repeated the mistake the second time round and lives could have been saved. It's difficult for me to let go of and it's still I still have a lot of problems with that. I still feel very angry about that. I feel anger about the staffing in intensive care. Intensive care has been running on relatively light staffing for ages and the, the crisis has exposed everything and asking intensive care nurses to work one to three, one to four, one to six in some places as far as I'm concerned, it's a violation of what it was, what your job title is and what you were asked to do. And I feel angry about having to stand by and do that and ask that of my colleagues and angry and sad with you and for you that you've had to do this and feel so morally distressed by it. What well, possibly the thing I feel most angry about is the dehumanization of the intensive care patient. Mm -hmm. And that is a very sad thing that unfortunately happened because we had to keep families out. So well, one of the blessings I had over the last four months is I got to work in a children's hospital and the nature of children is such that you can't keep the families out. So they have had a family member in. And before I worked there, I had completely forgotten how having family members around transform your perspective of the patient because they stopped being a lump in a bed with tubes and lines with a bunch of statistics. They stop being bed 13, they become a name, a face. You have pictures of them. You have somebody telling you their story, what they're like, what kind of things they like, what kind of things they don't like. And I'd forgotten all that. And I appreciate that what we've done and what we've had to do is a necessary evil. It hasn't stopped me from feeling so angry about it and desperately missing and longing for the days when we could have family members back in and patient stories back in and patients being human once again. Yeah, yeah. I definitely see the dehumanisation aspects of care, but I do think that part of that is for our own protection. We see that much mm. and have to grieve that many times with that many different families and patients that you can't, you, you put that barrier up and you have to, I think it's just a protective, we're protecting mm. ourselves by doing it. I don't agree with it and I'm, I, I fully agree with yourself. We need to get back to seeing the human that's in that bed, not the person, not just the things that are attached to them. Yeah, I agree. I suppose we, can, I suppose we could say that intensive care is an environment where dehumanisation is going to be, you know, at its highest, isn't it? Because our patients are often sedated and ventilated. Um, and we trust and rely on family members to give us the backstory, to fill us in 
you know, to bring the photographs to make them human um, and without the families there to do that, you know, it's been uh, an even tougher process. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's one of the biggest causes of moral distress uh, that I've seen in, in my colleagues and also in myself, because I agree with Sarah, it, it's often not easy, but it happens more readily on an intensive care unit that they do become patient in bed 13 with whatever condition they've got. And without the family there to tell you, oh, he doesn't like this radio station or, or you know, sitting there chatting about their relatives, um, you don't know the patient at all. We don't know our patients and it's, it's, it's hard to care for someone you know absolutely nothing about, you can't relate to them as a person, which is what they ultimately, obviously what they are, and what we want to get them back to. And if we don't know what they were before, how do we get them back to where they were before? And that's been very distressing for a lot of my team. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I think it's it's been a key thing, you know, if, if I were to, to name the one thing that has run through um, kind of staff one-to-one -one conversations I've had with staff struggling, it's it's not been, you know, I have PTSD, it's, it's not been I am burnt out, it's that I am not enough and I'm not giving enough of myself and it's that moral distress that it's heartbreaking to listen to um, and it's the thing that I've heard all the way through and I, I think it's also important to say just coming back to anger there's also moral outrage actually um, and the, the moral distress is when we kind of turn it in on ourselves moral outrage is when we're looking for someone else to blame in a way um, and I guess, you know, I come from a school of psychology where, where anger, anger can be really good for you, actually, as long as we don't take it out on ourselves um, and as long as we don't take it to aggression. Can we use our anger as an energy to say, how do we drive things forward? And I guess it, it comes to um, my second question to you guys, which is actually you know, what do we need to rehumanize our ICU for our patients, for our relatives when they return, but also for ourselves and each other? How how do we how do we get back the job that we want to be doing? Really difficult. That's really difficult. Yeah. I think yeah. we need I think the first step is to accept what we've actually done and still doing to a degree as well yeah. and accept that what we've done is real how we feel is real and once you start dealing with all those emotions that you previously showed and talking about them with your colleagues and building that team back up I think they'll come out stronger at the end but until we can accept what we're still going through and what we've been through I don't think we can start that yeah I think we need and I suppose this probably will be across the board. We need some time to just recharge our batteries. I think we spoke about this before, Julie, that people will actually be all right given the time to just, mm. you know, and I think we're already under pressure, aren't we, for the next thing. And, you know, there's the elective surgery that needs to start and, you know, and that's already there in the background for people and people are, you know, you can see them, they're like, well, you know, hang on a minute. And I, I just think there's got to be this massive focus on just giving people a little bit of time to process what's happened, recharge their batteries and find the love for the job again. And then they will carry on and they will, you know, things will get back to normal, won't they? But it's just, are we going to be allowed that time? yeah to process it it's and time is key isn't it time to acknowledge those feelings but also to make sense of what you've been through to get to a better place really yeah, yeah. I 100% agree with that Lorna we need time to excavate and debrief mm -hmm. and take a pause and a breath but equally, one thing that is resonating with me is we also need to learn lessons from what we've been through. Mm. And, you know, where's the best practice? 
I want to hear what your best practice is, Lorna, and yours, Amy, and yours, Nia, and Gemma, you know, everyone on here. I want to learn from that, and I want to implement that, you know, where I work, because, you know, we could have done some really great things, um, really great practice, and some not so great things, and I think this is the time that we need to be reflecting and learning lessons. For me, I feel like our biggest single gratitude goes to the redeployed staff that have come and, and helped, you know, how brave. They've come from every walk of, of you know, nursing and medics, um, from outpatients to theatres. So they've come to this brand new environment. You know, there's been the straight in, in the PPE, um, learning on the job. It's so courageous and we have such gratitude, but learning now, um, you know, some of our redeployed staff have been with us during both the waves. So collectively about six to eight months and they've learned the skill on the job, but thinking how can we best utilize our skills if another wave comes, I think now is an important time to underpin that with education and get some training in place. So yes, they've been looking after a patient attached to a ventilator, but how do they work that ventilator? You know, and I think it would be um, credit and do justice to them to underpin it with some learning and education. They deserve that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think our team deserves that as well, though. Like we've we've dealt with COVID. We know that we've we're prone, we know what we do with COVID. So the pancreatitis that are going to start coming through or the surgical patients, I think we need to acknowledge that we need that time to refresh ourselves before we can... Education has taken yeah. a backseat, hasn't yeah. it? Very much. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, think I mean, I... Sorry, dear. Go on. Sorry, go on, Gemma. Go on. No, it's fine. no, you go. I feel for the, the brand new nurses who've started mm. in the middle of COVID and, and God love them and... and they are utterly amazing because where I work, we've actually started newly qualified staff members in the middle of a pandemic. Um, to the extent that some of those nurses are looking after two and three patients after being newly qualified for three or four months. Um, they have been phenomenal. My biggest concern about them is what happens when we do go back to the normal because they've never done that. And how are they going to cope with, with that? And all of a sudden it's completely different all over again. I think they're going to get the feelings that we've had in the pandemic after it's all over, when we think everyone's normal and all of a sudden they're going to be totally confused. So I, I have fears for that as well. I have to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say the other thing, I think in, in addition to all of the things that I've already said is just the, the, the need to be listened to. I think Sagan touched on it, that we've known that we've been under-resourced and underfunded and under, you know, for, forever. Um, we've tried to communicate it and, and demonstrate it and have done countless pieces of work about the value of various professions within ICU, um, the impact that has on patients. I think the, the good thing is that we've managed to demonstrate all of those things and the value of rehab that's definitely on the agenda and the value of, of that one-to-one -one nursing care and what happens when we don't have it and the need for a skilled workforce. But I really hope that we are totally listened to and there's, and there's not only listened to there's actually action behind it and that we don't have to face a future that, that continues with the same challenges that we've identified because yes we've done it but we've done it and we're now all feeling the way we feel and actually if we were appropriately staffed and appropriately funded and we we could do amazing things yeah. um so yeah i think it, it's that bit of the the lessons learned and, and moving forward as well to ensure that we do have services that are fit for purpose um, and we're not just doing it because we're all great people and can do it um, but we you know that we we do it to the best of our ability with the best mm -hmm. workforce that we can possibly yeah. have absolutely i'm so worried i'm i'm so worried that the um staffing ratio will you know we've done such a great job of, of looking after two, three, four patients in some areas. I'm so 
afraid, personally speaking, that the staffing ratios might remain the same going forward. That's but, that's the biggest worry on our unit as well. I think people are just because we've done it and we've done it really, really well, doesn't mean we should have to carry on doing it. No. Yeah, know. totally. Totally agree. That's a widespread belief from various people that I've spoken to in various units as well. That we we managed, we did it. And the powers that are going to be uh, powers that be are going to look and say, well, they did it then. Why can't they do it on a normal day? Yeah, yeah it's a big. Concern. I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt you there, guys, because you guys are it's brilliant that there's so much to say, but we've only got ten minutes left, and I'd really <laughs> like to take some information in from the audience to to just open it up. But I guess what I I would say just just to that whole thing, um, Gemma, um, a, a, a friend of mine, a non non ICU professional, but a psychologist said, I, I, I think they think this is the war to end all wars and it'll all go back to normal. And let's remember the war to end all wars was the first world war. Um, and there is absolutely something here about saying, don't just say when we're through, we're through and we don't learn from this. Um, and the, there's great practice out there and there's great teamwork out there, but there's also what happens when you push people to breaking point. And actually, you know, we've done it, but we've broken people in the process of doing that. And we've, we've or we've come close to for so many people. And it's so, so important that this is, this is not that new normal. So let's, let's take some Q and A. Um, so people have, have been sort of um, kind of, oh, someone's been, uh, Shagan, you're really good at answering Q&A. Have you been answering some Q&A as we've been going along? Um, yes, I just mentioned a few things, but there's four questions that are actually really, really good and really pertinent that I think the, we should pay the, attention yeah. to. Yeah, the open Yeah, one. so okay. like the first, the first one from um, Atul Garg is actually really interesting about um so he asks the cqc and media attention to dna cpr has led to most families refusing to agree to dna cpr and icu patients this has led to even more moral distress and he asks if we have any comments um i guess i could start um yeah i think it's been variable actually it's it's there has been heightened attention to DNA CPR. There, there has been no, there's no doubt to that. And I guess part of this has also been the, been the rise of Dr. Google. So there's always been lots of therapies that people look up and say, we should try. So, you know, everything from ivermectin to hydroxychloroquine to ECMO to whatever. And that has made, I think it's a reflection of the fact that end of life conversations have become a thousand times more difficult when done remotely in a pandemic where there is misinformation flying left, right and center and people don't have the opportunity to reflect and grieve properly. And um, I think you're, I think Atul's absolutely right. This has been part of the huge toll that has been taken from us. It's so much easier to have an end of life conversation when a family member has been able to watch the disease process with you at the bedside over weeks and then they can truly identify that this is not necessarily something that their relative would want as opposed to you just telling them vital signs over the phone and them having a different picture in their head and how we deal with that going well how we deal with that now it's very difficult we have a lot of challenge to hold on to a lot of moral distress as a result to hold on to and a lot of reflection on that to hold on to. And I suppose moving forward, there will be conversations around how new ways of handling end of life care, how we ensure families are supported better to understand the decisions that we make and how we ensure that we are supported better when dealing with such an abnormal scenario. I mean, breaking their bad news to somebody over the phone will still does not feel normal to me and will never feel normal to me. And I don't know about the rest of you. I think we, I had a conversation with a, a doctor the other week and I think without realising it, especially I think as nurses, we become, we only see it from a nursing perspective and we become quite self. And I suppose as much as we found it hard and we're dealing 
with a lot of death and uh, actually the doctors having to make those decisions and make those phone calls over and over and over again you, you forget I think the toll that that's going to take on the doctors and you know they might get to a point where they're like I don't want to keep phoning relatives I don't want to keep filling out DNARs I don't you know but I think especially I think as nurses we do we forget that we 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 become quite tunnel visioned at seeing our job and seeing it from our perspective and it's it's distressing us seeing this patient um but yeah I've had to sort of step back and look at it from their point of view that it's been relentless for them making those phone calls and giving that bad news over the phone and yeah i wonder whether this oh, sorry go on. oh sorry i was talking over someone yeah i i i wonder whether this um this piece about the the, the relatives not having the relatives there face to face i think is is really important and interesting um i think i think it's always really energizing when you know when you're in when you're on the unit and the relatives are there you know you 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 can you can you know you can you can just you can see that love that the intensity of the feelings they've got for the patient in the bed um and i think that i think that's kind of that's i hadn't really considered it before but not having them there i think has brought into focus the positivity that the relatives being on the unit and having relatively open visiting brings um and so regard, yeah, regarding the CPR, you know, as Shagan said, I think, you know, in, in my experience, 20 odd years or what have you, um, most of the time when you get towards that conversation, when the relatives are there, the relatives, it's, it's, it's easy. It's quite a, it's not easy. That's the wrong, that's the wrong term, but it's, you know, they, they've seen it coming over time. You've built that relationship. Yeah. Um, so this, this heightened um, tension around DN, DNA, CPR or audits and things like that. I wonder whether that's part of that. You've gained the family's trust as well, though, mm -hmm. haven't you? When they're there, they trust you. They they're not I don't, you know, it's a phone call, isn't it? It's a voice at the end of the phone. I don't know how much I would trust that voice, but you know, we're asking the, a lot of the relatives to just put complete trust in somebody, a complete stranger. Whereas mm -hmm. if they're there, they get to know us, they trust us, they trust our decisions and mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think the the bedside nurses are hugely influential in in guiding families along the lines sort of preparing them ready for that DNA CPR conversation days and weeks before it even happens because the experienced ICU nurse will will see the path that the patient's going down and and you're having those conversations with the relatives day in day out of the bedside without actually saying those words so they don't come as a surprise when when the, the doctor speaks to them and, you know, in my role, I sit kind of, I suppose, one foot in each camp. We're working with the doctors, but I am a nurse. Um, and to see consultants of many years, critical care experience, having back-to-back -back multiple conversations about DNA CPRs. And uh, yes, you can come in and see your loved one, but actually only because this is the end of their lives on a day-to-day -day basis at the peak of the crisis. I mean, those consultants were destroyed. I've never seen anything like it in my in my. 25 years never seen anything like it um and i think the the amount of those conversations and the dna cpr decisions that were made how they are carrying those i i don't understand i don't understand how they're managing to get through it i really feel for them from a relative's perspective you know how are they ever going to deconstruct this they might have seen the the husband and wife be taken away in an ambulance at the doorstep kiss them goodbye and then through there, they've gone to a ward and they've deteriorated there and then they've been admitted to ITU where they've been ventilated. And then it's been daily phone calls with the doctors, perhaps, you know, Zooming as well. And then comes the breaking of bad news. And we've, you know, we've done everything we can for them. Um, and this is the end of the life. You just can't even begin to imagine that situation and not being there and present and living through it. It's going to take years to, to work through that. I, I think just, just to kind of link that, there's a, another comment in the Q&A of um, if it's not PTSD, then you're not really, um, you're not struggling. And I think there is something about the collective grief 
that we need to acknowledge that's a big part of the emotion. So the, the losses of so many patients um, and how on earth we grieve when we don't have those rituals around endings, um, but also standing by and, and, and bearing witness. And, you know, a lot of staff have sort of said to me that, that they have been the hand that has been the kind of hand in place of the relative um, at end of life. Um, and it, that that grief is just huge to carry and just kind of stays with us the whole time. And that's a big part of acknowledging what we've been through, isn't it? Um, we, need, we, we are actually out of time, but I feel like we need to take a, just an, another question or two, if you're um, willing, just to, for a few more minutes for our audience. We might have a few people drop off um for we have a little um kind of look at some of those things there are some people sort of saying i think we might be kidding ourselves about uh returning back to any any pre-pandemic normal and i think that's worth acknowledging that anger and that anticipation um that is there um and I, go on lorna no, sorry so carry on it's all right <laughs> Um, a really important thing about someone for our panel, just for you all to say thank you for sharing the stories. Um, you know, at the beginning, I felt alone. Um, I think I, uh, with this, I know we all feel the same, but hearing your testimonial made me realise how many, um, she said nurses, but we've got more than nurses here, but how many nurses feel like me. Um, and after I talk about my ITU stories and feeling um, that participating in, in webinars, you know, I sometimes feel that I'm alone with this. Um, and is there is there more of a solution than time? Um, and I mean, I wonder about how, you know, for me, one of the most amazing things about webinars is, you know, look, look some of you are my local colleagues some of you I met pre-pandemic and some of you I've only ever met on screen actually um and you know I, I I think of you as my my new friends and colleagues and I think there's something about the way in which we connect with each other across and beyond our ICUs that has to be part of that that's that's one one thing I would say that helps with the healing. Any other thoughts from you guys in terms of what will help with our healing? I think it's very individualized. Sorry. No, no, carry on. <laughs> I think it's very individualized as to if we go back to the original slides as to how you are feeling at the time and what it is you need. Mm -hmm. And again, it goes back to that accepting that it's okay to feel like this and you don't need to compare to your colleague who sat next to you in the break room and compare how you both feel because neither outweigh another you feel how you feel and seek the support it's there it's out there you don't have to be a member of anything you can get access to it uh, to, to support wherever you need it yeah yeah thank you amy lorna i think a little peer support plug not intentional but i think and it, and it sounds really, really silly when I say it out loud, but having done the peer support days, it was a massive realisation for me that this is meeting people from all around the country and they're all saying the same things. Because I think you, for whatever silly reason, you think it's just your hospital and it's mm -hmm. just happening to you. And, and when you start talking to different people all across the country, for me, that was really therapeutic and really, really helped. And I did. I kind of didn't expect that. I hadn't even thought about that. But it was like, oh my god, you know, it's. It was quite. It was reassuring in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. The peer support stuff has been great, but also the um, psychoeducation courses that the ICS are running free. They've helped me enormously, and it's very much the same thing. And that you, particularly the one Julie reminded me, I can't one the one that runs over the four weeks, and you're in the same. The same sustain you're in the same group for four weeks and, and you're talking to the same people and, and I found that enormous enormously helpful definitely yeah 
Absolutely. So thanks for the plug there, Nia. So the, these are courses that um, I wrote myself, but I, I have a lovely, lovely team of psychologists delivering them for me. Um, and they are free to you. So and they're running for the next two years. So there is time for you to get your place in that. So please, and you don't need to be an ICS member to do that. So, um, so please do access that. And also, please, if you do need that individualized one to one support, go to our wellbeing hub and, and request that and that's free and confidential as well. So, so yeah, any it's last the kind of smoothing we're going to get through uh, this pandemic. Yeah. is the social snoozing by doing the peer support absolutely absolutely <laughs> and connecting connecting yeah we've gone on guys thank you so much as always you know in, in your mid revising mid annual leave mid evening giving above and beyond like good icu professionals that you do um, throughout this entire pandemic and just that little bit more for us this evening. Thank you so much. And thank you to the audience for your comments. Sorry that we didn't get through all of your comments and questions, but thank you for joining with us. Um, so this has been recorded and it will be shared later for people who haven't been able to access it. Um, luckily no one swore, so we're all good on the editing fronts, but I will say farewell to our audience and I will stop recording. <laughs>